24 hours in, in horrendous weather conditions uh, and they've just survived, because they all survived, uh, two helicopter crashes. The Argentine forces that were on the island, we basically persuaded them to give up. crashed again. Mick, how are you, shipmate? Yeah, I'm good, Chris. Uh, nice to meet you, uh, virtually, <laughs> as we do these days. Uh, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm uh, just getting on with my life, you know, and uh, uh, I'm happy. Mm. Is this, does this, uh, this 40th, anniversary of the Falklands bring bring you any challenges? Uh, it brings me reflections, Chris. Um, I am aware of the uh, anniversaries. You know, anybody who was in San Carlos in uh, 21st of May 1982 doesn't need to set a reminder on their phone. Um, I guess I'm one of the lucky ones uh, following the conflict I pretty much got on with my life and it was only until many years later um, I started to look back at the Falklands and I hadn't realized the horrendous uh, trauma that it had left a lot of people with and I didn't know that there was more veterans who committed suicide than actually died in the conflict itself. And um, I don't consciously remember uh, saying to myself, right, I'm putting this behind me. The mind's a funny thing, and I think it did it for me. Um, it pricks you, doesn't it, if, if you're lucky. And uh, since then, I have become aware of some of the serious messages that these uh, these lads are still in, lads. I mean, they're all 60 and that now, but, you know, every one of them will tell you that the, the Falklands War was 40 years ago, but to those involved, it was yesterday and always will be. So, no, not really challenges, but reflections and considerations for the impact that it's had on other people less fortunate than myself. Yes, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because... Um... There's a bit of a problem being in the forces, and that is if you're not careful, your identity lies in what you did 40 years ago. Yes. You know, um, and life should move on. But well, it's, sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, subsequent experiences that I've had, um, unconnected with the Falklands, which I really don't want to go into on this this podcast, uh, actually ended up uh, leaving me with PTSD. So I do have uh, some appreciation um, and I'm well aware of the point that you make there about you've got to move on. Mm. If, you, if you stay rooted in the past, it'll destroy you without doubt. Yes, exactly. It's not meant to be a, a criticism of anybody. It's, 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 um, I think the problem or challenge being in the military is it very much forms a part of young men's identities. And that in itself can be problematic. Mm -hmm. When you overlay on top of that something as traumatic as the Falklands, then it's not just, you know, I don't know, in the Marines case, reliving getting your green berry all those years ago. It's actually reliving something that's that's going to have an awful big effect on on your life. And um, there's there's nobody there after you leave the forces to to explain all this to you, to get to get you to move on. And so you're faced with these 
unreal situations that the vast majority of people on this planet will never ever have to go through and then you're kind of like oh, yeah then you're kind of like um you know you can get stuck on them is what i'm trying to say well if you're fortunate enough to have uh, people around you that are prepared to support you speak to you um and try and understand uh, these traumas, then, then again, you, you're really fortunate. But you know, so many of the veterans uh, uh, from subsequent uh, wars, my, they're on the street, and nobody cares about them, mm. and uh, they're left on their own. Yeah, when when you leave the forces, uh, you you have to go and build new skills. You have to uh, you have to go and work out. Um, your way forward and uh, for a lot of the veterans they, they can't do that and some of them sadly take the, uh, uh, take the other route out Yeah and we should remember as well it's not just those that commit suicide um, people who drink themselves to death that doesn't get reflected in the statistics No People who go and you know put their family through domestic violence as a as a mm -hmm. byproduct of their trauma that none of this gets this none of this gets mentioned um yeah war is an aw awful thing did you did you ever expect to be going to a war when you joined the navy well before we started recording there i was talking about these uh, uh aerograms that um, i'd written uh, back to my uh, mother and in one of them I actually say uh, I didn't really expect it, but it's what I was paid to do. And, and I, you know, it was always a possibility. Uh, but at the time in 82, it was the middle of the Cold War. And, um, you know, the troubles in Northern Ireland. So I, like many of my shipmates and, and, and uh, other members of the task force, probably didn't even know where the Falklands was. Um, although it's funny, when I went back down in 2019, there was a lot of material in the, the Veterans Lodge, and a hell of a lot of it was about the uh, battles fought down in the Falklands in 1914 in the First World War. So I, was, I kind of wondered why that wasn't included in our military history. Uh, um, we should have known about that. But none of us knew where they were. Uh, you very often hear the uh, the comments, oh, we thought they were in uh, uh, off the north of Scotland. Well, our first t task was uh, South Georgia. So when they mentioned, you know, Georgia, I was thinking, well, isn't that in America? Is the Yanks are going to be a bit peed off about that, are they not? But um, no, we were suddenly brought up to speed. It, uh, that um, that uh, do you want me to just talk about that at the moment, or do you, mate? We can talk about what 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 whatever we um, whatever we we want. Let uh, I mean, Antrim was a destroyer, right? Was it what they call it a county class destroyer? The guided missile destroyer. They were designed in the late fifties. And uh, I think Antrim was launched in uh, 1970. They were Cold War vessels mm -hmm. with the main armament system called Sea Slug. And it was a long range uh, missile which accelerated something like Mach 2 when it left the launcher. And it was designed to be fired for the, for the Cold War, like for, for battles out at, out at sea. But it. it uh, mm -hmm. We went to South Georgia, obviously, but the, the part when we went into San Carlos, it became pretty useless because you need airborne early warning, you need guidance and what have you, and, and it was surrounded by hillsides. So really, you were you were throwing punches all over the place, but um, they were less than effective uh, as far as the main missile system was concerned. But... Um, we had sailed from Portsmouth in uh, mid-March 
1980. We were heading from Gibraltar along with uh, a company of other ships, such as Sheffield, uh, Coventry and uh, Glamorgan. And we were going down to do exercise spring training. We were supposed to be away about six weeks or something like that. And then we were coming back to Portsmouth. And then Antrim was scheduled to go to County Antrim uh, for a ship's visit. Um, I'd never been to Northern Ireland before. All I knew about it was what I saw on the TV. And my elder brother had done a couple of tours out there on minesweepers. Um, and we were heading back to the UK. And uh, so we were sailing north. And I was morning watch and I was, you know, you go in, you, the responsibilities are to get the breakfast going and preparations for lunch. Anyway, um, after a couple of hours, I got a chance to go and get a cigarette and a cup of tea. And I went on the upper deck and uh, I remember I was standing on the port side and I was watching, uh, looking at the sun. And I'm thinking, the sun doesn't rise in the west. <laughs> What's going on here? And uh, this was the morning of uh, April 2nd. So, you know, I, I went back down to the galley and I said, why, why are we sailing south? And nobody knew at that moment in time. And then um, shortly after that, the commander came on the tannoy and he told us that the Argentines had uh, invaded the Falkland Islands and that we were, uh, we were going to be going down there to... Um, to take them back and that's when they started mentioning south georgia because all the pictures and the, f the footage that you see of the task force leaving portsmouth you see the hermes and the invincible and what have you well they were some three days behind us and we were a couple of thousand miles ahead of them already because we were in in gibraltar so um we all peeled off and headed to ascension island and uh, what happened is the uh, um, the powers that be decided which ships were going down south and which ships were returning to the UK. And basically, um, the ships that were heading south cannibalised the ships that were heading north. We took every ounce of food, fuel, armaments, everything that we could get, and it was a really frantic couple of days. It was hugely physically demanding because all the stuff has to be picked up and put somewhere. Uh, we had a crew of 450, but we were supplemented by uh, uh, a lot more Marines. I think they were M Company 42. And the helicopters were racing between the ships, doing what they call vertrep, which is a, a vertical replenishment, it just refers to the helicopter picking stuff up and taking it from ship to ship. Um, and we made our way uh, down to Ascension Island. Now, it's important to point out as a feature of my story that is that prior to any of this happening, when I joined the Navy, I wanted to be an air engineering mechanic and the uh, the recruiting office said well there aren't any spaces at the moment so why don't you join up as a chef if you want to get it now that I've since found out that's just a, a ruse to fill up <laughs> whatever spaces they want filling up but I, I liked cooking anyway and I and I just I wanted to um, I wanted to get out of Stoke-on-Trent the uh, uh, the Take that auditions weren't running at that time, so I joined the Navy instead. Um, anyway, an opportunity came up uh, to work alongside the flight crews. When you go into defence watches on a warship, you basically split the crew in half, and that includes the flight crew. So you'll be working 12-hour shifts. When you split the flight crew in half, there are not sufficient numbers of them to effectively run the flight. Uh, we had a, a Wessex 3 uh, helicopter called Humphrey. So what they do is they had uh, um, a course called SMAC 19. They completely changed it to SMAC 22. 
and they would stick you on a pontoon in the middle of Portland Harbour and they would send all manner of helos out and you had to, um, you, when they landed, you had to strap them down. You, you got taught basic uh, firefighting and uh, although during the Fultons there was an awful lot of mission creep. Uh, we spent an awful lot of our time in defence watches on the Antrim, as did all the others. So as a consequence of that, the majority of my war was actually not in the galley, but on the upper deck. Uh, I've sent you a photograph uh, taken up showing the damage on the side of the Antrim. And uh, you can see where all the, the shells went through. Uh, the guy standing on the very far right of that photograph is me. So um, we got down to Ascension and it, a place I'd never heard of, uh, but it's like uh, the surface of the moon. And it was massively busy. There was aircraft coming and all the time there was uh, Hercules everywhere ships all over the place uh, one of the other photos that I've sent you is of a uh, Type 42 sitting off the coast of um, Ascension I, I believe that's uh, Sheffield that's, um, one of the uh, things that I, I commented on your channel uh, the other day was you were interviewing a guy from 42 and he was talking about where they'd done a speed uh, march and then they all stripped off and jumped in the sea and then they all came screaming out uh, one of them had a, a black fish attached to his backside and I commented that to, to my recollection they were parrotfish and uh, you could see them because the waters off Ascension are extremely clear and you can see quite a distance down and the uh, lads were trying to catch these parrotfish as they were trying to pull them up on these uh, steel hooks. Uh, these fish would bite straight through the hooks. But uh, that royal was lucky because below the parrotfish were the hammerhead sharks. And if they come out with one of those attached to their backside, it would have been <laughs> a bad day. Um, anyway, we uh, the, the task force was approaching... Ascension Island and um, then we were given our orders to peel off um, there was ourselves Plymouth Tide Spring I think brilliant as well uh, we were told to go and head down to South Georgia and uh, meet up with Endurance um, it, I can't remember how long it took to get down there, but it is quite a distance and it took quite a while. The, the most notable, no, noticeable things uh, on the way down there was the complete change in the environment. Um, you, you've got the North Atlantic, and then which is okay, and then you, you reach Ascension. But between Ascension and South Georgia, you really are heading onto the other side of the planet. And... Amongst all the expected threats that we had uh, from submarines, the aircraft threat really wasn't too too much of a problem, as in, you know, bombers or fighters, because of the distance, because uh, South Georgia is about eight 900 miles east of the Falklands. The submarine threat was, uh, was very relevant. But one of the biggest threats was the weather. Um, there were icebergs off South Georgia and I've never seen seas like them in my life uh, that they, they, they can be flat calm and you can turn into a, a, a force 10 in a matter of half an hour it's incredible it, it's stunningly beautiful but it's deadly uh, anybody who's sailed in the waters in the, the South Atlantic will, will tell you that especially off Drake's passage off South America and places like that. Um, when we left Ascension to head down there, we were supplemented by, I think it was D Squadron, SAS. Uh, and I think uh, Plymouth maybe picked up some SBS. Um, 
you all ask about that. An awful lot of Marines, uh, the, the kings on the ship were very, very cramped. Um, there wasn't enough uh, beds. People were hot bunking. I remember some of the SAS lads were actually uh, sleeping in the uh, in their sleeping bags in the the gulches, which is like where the, away from the mess deck you've got the, the bunks, and then you get the gulches where the lockers are. And they probably thought they was quite handy and out of the way there, but they found out to the cost that when uh, when they sounded action stations, they got trampled. <laughs> Loads of matlows running over them. Um, I think we were probably actually quite in. It, I don't know. Uh, we were intrigued about our new uh, guests on board the, the SAS because remember this was only two years after the Iranian embassy when they'd burst out into the into the public realm. You know, people didn't know who they were, and then all of a sudden, um, there we were sitting there w- watching them load. The magazines. I remember waking up uh, uh, one day when they were about to go ashore, and had this thing sitting on my uh, on my stomach where they were just piling stuff out, getting all the gear, and it said, uh, "This side towards enemy." <laughs> um, I wasn't familiar with these kinds of ordnance and that, but I soon found out what it was. Uh, but they were a they were a good bunch of lads. Mm. Um, Anyway, we we knew that there was Argentine garrisons uh, on South Georgia and that we'd been tasked to go and uh, sort it out, basically. And um, we were poking and prodding around the islands. We knew that there was a submarine threat, which turned out to be the Santa Fe. Um, I don't know if I get this one in the... In the I think we took out the Santa Fe before we attempted uh, landings. Um, our Wessex was uh, flying around and they detected this submarine on the surface. And uh, the uh, navigator uh, at the time, Lieutenant Chris retired, I think. Um, he dropped a couple of depth charges on them and then combined uh, links and um, what were they called? WASP helicopters. They had AS-12 missiles and uh, torpedoes and essentially they, 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 they crippled it and it limped into Grip Viken. Um, But the, the, the lads were trying to do uh, the Marines and the SAS. I think it was the SAS first. The, they were trying to be inserted into uh, Gritviken, uh, not Gritviken, Fortuna Glacier, which is an extremely wild uh, environment. I do believe that they were actually advised against it, but um, the decision was made that they were going in and they... They went in and they were sitting on the glacier for, I think, 24 hours. And the, the, the reports were that the, the wind was so strong that it blew the tents away. It was like 100 mile an hour wind. And at some stage, they requested uh, an extraction. And we had a couple of Wessex 5 helicopters from RFA Tide Spring, which was a, a Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Uh, I can't remember if it was an oiler or if it was a it carried dry stores and ammunition. Anyway, uh, one of them flew in to try and extract them. And I believe it's uh, when it was trying to take off, it was a complete whiteout. You couldn't see anything, this consequence of the weather down there. And as it tried to take off, uh, one of its wheels clipped a rock and it just went over. And I think there was 16 17 guys on board uh, and it crashed. So they requested another uh, extraction and the other Wessex five uh, went in after them and all the the guys piled on board it. 
and they went to take off and they crashed again. Um, so you're talking about people who've been sitting on a glacier for 24 hours in, in horrendous weather conditions uh, and they've just survived, because they all survived, uh, two helicopter crashes. The only helicopter left capable of picking them up was our Wessex 3. But the role of our Wessex 3 was it was an anti-submarine helicopter. So therefore, the uh, the back end of the helicopter was just full of um, sonar equipment. And I remember that they said, right, we've, we've got to get all this stuff out now. And um, this is part of the mission creep, I suppose, with myself. It was just handed a spanner and, you know, take this off there, get that out of there. And, and we stripped the whole thing out. And uh, Lieutenant Commander Ian Stanley and his co-pilot, I think his name was Stuart Cooper, he's a young lad from Fife. They went in uh, and tried again and they were successful. They picked them all up and brought them back to the ship. And it's one of the things that I remember about, about them when, when they got back. We also picked some of them up uh, from Gemini's uh, that the motors had stopped uh, and they were just bobbing around helpless in the water. The, the guys in the helicopter and the guys that we rescued from the Gemini, it was the most notable thing is when we got back on board and, and we were helping them out and some of the lads were saying to them, uh, there's, there's hot food in the, in the galley, there's hot drinks in the galley, the dock wants to see you in the, in the sick bay. Every single one of them went down to the mess, stripped all the weapons, cleaned them, looked after the gear, and then they went and got something to eat. And I, I've, I had to admire the, 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 not just the physical toughness, but the mental toughness of these people. And uh, they, they, were, they were pretty impressive, actually. They were very, very determined. Um, I remember one of them uh, telling me that as he was making his way around the side of this mountain, he came across a, an albatross nest and he was wearing these waterproofs, which he had to wear down there because of the, of the weather. And he was quite a short fella. And when he got back on board, all around his groin area, all his waterproofs were ripped. And I says, what, what happened there, mate? And he says, uh, come across this bloody albatross and it was sitting in a nest and like a baby albatross. And they're quite a size, even when they're a baby. And he's got this big beak and he says, and I'm clinging to this, this mountain. And this effing thing's kind of like this, ripping his waterproofs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, he was more concerned about this chick than being halfway up the side of a mountain where you could fall off into in, in horrendous conditions. So no, I was, I was, uh, I, I remember, I do remember thinking to myself, well, if we've got guys like this on our side, then we stand a good chance here. But uh, we did eventually take South Georgia back and uh, nobody was killed at the time. Um, <clears throat> one of the one of the casualties, uh, the the POWs that came off for of Santa Fe, uh, I remember he was stretched off and he had half his leg missing. Uh, I was told at the time that uh, some torpedo would come loose or something, and and they'd ended up it landed on his leg, and he had to have his leg amputated. Um, whether that was the case or not, I don't know. But I just remember this lad was screaming his head off as he came past. This brought the the uh, the reality of the situation uh, right in front of your face. Uh, anyway, what happened after that is that the Argentine uh, forces that were on the island, we basically persuaded them to give up. And the way that we did this was Antrim and Plymouth laid down naval gunfire support but they did it to either side of the argentine positions and over a period of time they basically came in closer and closer and it was really it wasn't an exercise designed to kill anybody it was an exercise designed to 
show the futility of their position. And it worked. And uh, uh, the Marines went and took the surrender of the main force. And then later on, uh, Nasty Asti, uh, Captain Asti's, signed over the surrender of his forces in his part of the island on board uh, HMS Plymouth. Um, we, we took a load of prisoners from South Georgia, and I don't know if I've mentioned this already, I might have forgotten, but nobody on a warship has one job. Everybody has multiple tasks. And one of those tasks on Antrim that I got uh, occasionally, we were heading north with the Argentine prisoners of war on Tide Spring, and we had Astis on Antrim, and we also had three Chilean scrap metal merchants. Their terms of uh, uh, the, the way we held them, they were civilians, so that there were no armed guards for them. But Astis had an arm, there were two armed guards every time. Uh, he was let out of his cabin, and we had to exercise him uh, walking around the upper deck. And that fellow exuded arrogance. And uh, he, if you ever want to know what a, what a Nazi looks like, or, 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 the sort of arrogance that they give off, it was him. And we used to have to basically march him around at gunpoint and then sing back to his cabin. It was only a few years ago, actually, that I uh, read an article about him that apparently, I don't know if it was on Antrim uh, or, or on a, a subsequent ship, but apparently he broke off a bed spring and uh, fashioned it into a, a sort of dagger you know, that you could hold on to the spring and then uh, and try to have a go at a couple of the lads that were uh, escorting him. I don't know what good it would have done him on a, a ship in the middle of the South Atlantic, right? I used to know where to go. But um, he was wanted for his involvement in the murder of around 5,000 people. Because remember at the time, the, the Argentine Junta, they had a big problem where they, they used to disappear there political opposition and there was around about 30,000 of them so we we took them almost up to uh, Ascension Island uh, and then transferred them all to other vessels and then they were going to be repatriated uh, via Uruguay and once we'd carried this out we then joined up with the main task force and we turned south uh, as we were going down to work on the uh, the, the Falkland Islands and to try and to try and free them, um, I'll, I'll tell you something now that uh, come into play later on. Uh, I was on the upper deck; it was warm, so we must have still been around that ascension. And I remember looking up, and I could see this Vulcan bomber flying overhead and um, I just took it it was you know part of the the task force I didn't know anything about black book missions or, or anything about that I only found out about all that later um, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that anyway uh, we were heading back down to the Falcons some of the ships had already been down there and had been fired on Argentine positions, naval gunfire support, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and probably insert in SF uh, to, for reconnaissance or whatever. But we eventually were told that we were going to uh, escort the landings, uh, the main landings, and, uh, and it was going to be the 21st of May. Um, The weather had been pretty bad, 
uh, but the morning of the 21st of May was actually quite nice, which is exactly what you don't want. Uh, Ardent led the way in, and I think we were behind the Ardent, and we had put some SBS into Fanning Head, which uh, is a, a position at the, the mouth of San Carlos. And we steamed into San Carlos and we were laying down some naval gunfire at Fanning Head as well. Um, and it was all it was all pretty quiet. Yeah, and, and later on, because we we kept GMT, so we were um, like four how four hours ahead, I think it was, or three hours ahead of the Falklands. Uh, so our day was starting much, much earlier. But as it started to get light, all you could see was ships everywhere. And it was a huge amount of activity and they were trying to get the guys ashore. There's this massive, great big ship that I later found out was the Canberra. And I remember looking at it and thinking, who the hell thought that was a good idea? Because it was just a huge target. Um, anyway, I, I can't remember, it's maybe about 10 or 11 o'clock, something like that. The first of the air attacks started and that, uh, that was a serious wake up call. These jets appeared from the, the, the end, which would it be, I think maybe the south end of San Carlos. They would just pop up over the hill. You couldn't see them coming. By the time you saw them, they were on you. They were doing, I don't know, 400 miles an hour or something like that. Uh, one of the photographs uh, I've sent you, it's not, uh, I don't know, it's from Antrim. It's a, a common one, shows two A4 Skyhawks coming in. It's uh, either gun camera footage or it's uh, uh, from one of the missile platforms and um, they cut us up they 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 were there were bombs everywhere the, the, the noise was unbelievable there was gunfire uh, there was there was smoke and I had gone below uh, for something for some reason I can't remember and there was this massive crash uh, it was just like the, the hit, and um, the sea slug weapon system. We just fired uh, one or two sea slugs uh, just to get some lead in the air, I suppose. And the second that the sea slug had left the launcher, this bomb came straight down and smashed through the uh, screen doors that open up to load the missile into the launcher. And it just cut straight through it like butter. And it went through several bulkheads after that, the, the, the kinetic force of this thing being dropped from a jet flying at hundreds of miles an hour was incredible. And it just smashed through all these bulkheads and then it went up and it hit the flight deck from underneath and that left a bump in the flight deck and then it crashed down into the after heads, the heads uh, what you call in the navy it's the toilets and it just smashed into the after heads and the lads up top oh that, that's why i'd gone below um i've been sent down there they 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 thought that there might be a fire below the flight deck and that had caused the flight deck to buckle well, actually directly underneath the hangar. Um, we were looking for firefighting equipment, uh, specifically a Y piece, because when you fight fire on a, on a ship, you will approach it with uh, two hoses, one which causes like a, a big uh, fan of thin water, and that's uh, that shields you from the heat. And then the other one is a jet, uh, and you poke that through the fan of water. I can't remember what they call it now. And you direct that at the fire. So we were all looking for this, this fire and the firefighting equipment. And we were running up and down 
the passageway on the port side. And I was heading forward to the front end of the ship. And one of the lads, Alan Deadmarsh, uh, he, he was a chef and he was running towards me. And it's, it's one of those things, it goes in slow motion. It's kind of like watching a car crash or something. I could see this ray of light, daylight, suddenly appear on from the port side of the ship, followed by another one and another one and another one. And we were being strafed and the shells were coming through the side of the ship and they were exploding. And uh, we just hit the deck and Alan was running towards me and I was running towards him. We both hit the deck at the same time, but his legs were poking up. <laughs> when all the smoke had cleared, and it, it, we were face to face and um, I thought he was grinning. It turned out he wasn't grinning, he was grimacing. This uh, piece of shrapnel had come across and taken a big chunk out of his leg and he was bleeding quite badly. And uh, while still lying on the deck, I grabbed him by his belt and we passed him in a line down to the first aid post, which was down the way so that he could get treated. And I stood up and as the, the smoke was clearing, it was just unbelievable. Well, the, 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 the inner bulkhead that led him to the main galley was just peppered with this, this shrapnel. And actually I waited for it to cool down and, uh, 40 years later, I've still got it. And you can, you can appreciate, like, with the jagged edges, what something like that is going to do to the human body uh, and does do to the human body. And it's actually really heavy as well. I have this kind of mad notion that if I keep it safe and in my safe, it can never have a go at me again. <laughs> but um, where are we? Yeah, we... We there were there were multiple air attacks that day, many of them, uh, and it's it's it really is a sight to behold. But we had to evacuate San Carlos because this bomb was sitting there in the afterheads, uh, unexploded. The damage that we'd taken had taken out the sea slug magazine, uh, no, the sea slug weapon system, we couldn't use it. We were having problems with the Sea uh, Cat short range missile systems. Um, I remember one of the operators saying he was standing on these pedals and it, the damn thing wouldn't, it wouldn't traverse. So we were left with the four Exocet missiles that we had, well, they were anti-ship. Um, <clears throat> the Argentine Navy had long since gone back to port um, we just had a four or five uh, uh, turret, uh, which wasn't really much use than other otherwise than persuading troops to give up. So we had to retreat from San Carlos, uh, and we I, I'll never forget as as we were sailing out of the mouth of San Carlos, which is extremely narrow. The uh, was HMS Ardent sitting there. Um, it just had all hell kicked out of it, and it clearly it was sinking. Uh, I, I remember standing on the port bridge wing as, as we went out. Um, it was done for, and many of the ships. I seem to remember Argonaut, that may have beached. There were, there were bombs thrown everywhere, we, but they, they weren't going off. Some of them were going off, but not all of them. I do remember that the BBC World Service helpfully uh, advised that the uh, pilots were dropping them too low so that the bombs weren't actually fused, you know, when they, when they let them go. Uh, I don't suppose they needed the BBC service to to advise them of that. I'm sure they worked it out themselves because when they came back, I don't know if you've ever seen the photograph of HMS Antelope exploding. 
Uh, is that the famous one, the big white? Yeah. The big white lighting up the sky. It's at night. Yeah, uh, it's taken at night. I, I didn't see that one, but having been in San Carlos, being familiar with the Type 21 Amazon class, which uh, Antelope and Ardent were, uh, I was damn glad that I wasn't on one of those because some genius had decided to build them mainly out of aluminium. So if you've got a fire on one of those, I've heard stories in the subsequent years of, of lads running along in the dark and just dropping through the decks where the decks had melted. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't even imagine that. Uh, we, we were quite lucky on the Antrim because they were a big old sturdy ship, but it depends what what hit you because uh, you probably know of what happened to our sister ship, the Morgan. Um, can, can, you, can you tell us? I can, well, I can only tell you secondhand, but I, I, when I was on the display team many years later, I met up with a guy, Dinger Bell, and he was a chef on the Glamorgan. And they were uh, doing naval gunfire support, suppressing the Argentine troops on, um, I can't remember the specific mountain, one of the ones around Stanley. And they were... They were at action station. They, they were doing this on a nightly basis and they fell out of action stations. And I remember Dinger saying to me that the chief cook had said to him when they fell out of action stations, Dinger, can you wet a pot of tea? Which for civvies is make a pot of tea. And he said, um, give us five, chief. He says, I'll just drop this stuff down uh, the mess because you, you had all your, your, your stuff that you had to have with you like your, your life belt and these these are uh, battle dressings that I've still got which you used to have strapped to your your life vest uh, and he said okay and Dinger went down to the mess and he heard a bang and he ran straight back up to the galley and they were all gone uh, just after they fell out of activations, there was a land-based Exocet launched from the back of Port Stanley. And I believe from the accounts that I've read that they saw it coming uh, and tried to take uh, evasive action, but it struck uh, at where the hangar is and it blew the helicopter apart through it into the sea the hangar doors into the sea and they, they were quite large the hangar doors and it, as I said to you about earlier on in the Antrim the galley is below the hangar well there was a put a big hole in the hangar and put a big just blew the galley apart um, left a massive hole in the deck uh, so that, that's what I was told. And actually, when we got back to the UK, uh, we were tied up next to Glamorgan. And I went on board and I saw I saw the damage and it was awful. They, they, they very nearly lost the Glamorgan. The Glamorgan was in serious trouble. And it was, um, so it's only the accounts that I've read of it and what Dinger has told me. They were damn lucky that they didn't go down. So... As sturdy as the county class was, um, if you get hit in the wrong place by the wrong piece of ordnance, then you're in trouble. Uh, it always makes me laugh when you hear this term non-combatants. Some of my, my shipmates and that refer to themselves as non-combatants. To my mind, there's no such thing as a non-combatant. If, if you look at the, uh, certainly years ago when the, first SAMA South Atlantic Medal Organization uh, Association website was set up. They had uh, uh, a list of all the uh, casualties. And in the Navy, there was more chefs killed than any other branch, uh, according to their figures. I think it had something to do with where the galley is placed uh, uh, in relation to the... Uh, 
in relation to the superstructure of the ship. Uh, we were we were all at risk from the exosets. And I remember that the boffins had sent down some design. You know, we all, these days, we want our aircraft to be stealthy, our ships to be stealthy, and we, we try and make, reduce the radar picture as much as we possibly can. And these boffins had sent down this, this design that was to be built on the ship, and it was made out of aluminium, I seem to remember. And the idea was that you hung it underneath the helicopter. And if uh, you detected an, an exoset inbound, that the pilot would jump into the helo and then just go straight up as fast as he could. Because what this thing was, was anti-stealth. And the idea was to trick the missile into seeking a bigger target than the ship. Now, that's an unenviable task. And I remember going into the hangar one time and I saw the two pilots and they were chatting in the corner and I can't prove it, but to this day, I swear they were drawing straws because who'd want that job? The idea was that it would, the exocet would see the bigger picture and then would start to raise up and it would get to such an angle. I believe the idea was it was supposed to tilt the gyro and then make it, uh, fall away harmlessly into the sea, but it was a theory, you know, <laughs> one that uh, I don't believe any of them put to the test. Uh, I think a lot. I think a lot of the ground troops watched that exocet go out. Did they not to Glamorgan? I think in some of the literature, they right? would have been in a position. I, I mean, I never set foot until two thousand and nineteen. Mm. Uh, when I went back, but doing the, the we, we were guided around all the different battlefields and that and, and looked at the, the ground troops war from, from their perspective. Uh, and yeah, I can well imagine that they would have been in a position to see that. Mm. Uh, when I went back in 2019, the things that struck me, standing on top of like Two Sisters or Harriet, things like that, there was no cover. How the hell did those guys get up the side of those mountains? I know a lot of it was done at night. There's nowhere to hide. Um, I had a, 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 a deep respect for them. Um, you know, what, what they did and against the, the elements as well, and also having to do that famous yom because all the heavy lift helicopters went down on the Atlantic conveyor. I think... I think um, I think we were quite lucky, actually. All of us. Uh, if they'd waited a couple of weeks, the weather would have closed in uh, to such an extent that it would have made the recovery of the islands impossible, and that would have given them what six months to dig in further. Uh, mistakes were made on both sides, but ultimately. You know, we prevailed. Um, it's. I had to go back in 2019. I, I, had, I hadn't carried a load of trauma around with me, but there was just this voice saying, it's time to go back. It's time to go back. And it gave me a massive, massively different perspective because I understood that I'd seen what I'd seen but that's just one piece of a jigsaw. You can't make a jigsaw with one piece. Um, I'd lost contact with uh, everybody, really, off the Antrim. And I ended up getting uh, getting in with a, a crew of veterans from uh, HMS Intrepid, which is a landing ship. Uh, a bunch of great guys, absolutely fantastic. But even though they were only maybe half a mile away from, from our ship in, in San Carlos water, and they were below deck, uh, they were taking on loads of prisoners. Their war, their perspective was completely different than mine, and we were on the same side half a mile apart. Um, so when I went back down, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to fill in a lot of those blanks, um, 
Anyway, uh, just to go back to this uh, unwanted guest that we had on board, this was the, the, the first experience that I'd had of the power of humour in war because it was really, really tense. What was happening was that they, they got the plan to cut a hole in the flight deck and gently lift this this bomb out. They weren't trying to defuse it. They were just going to lift it out and drop it over the side. It was resting next to the sea slug magazine. If it had gone off, it would have just vaporised. Oh, make one second, sorry. So the aft end of the ship, the back end of the ship, was out of bounds while they were uh, trying to uh, remove this bomb. And it took hours and hours and hours, and everybody was absolutely starving. And uh, everybody was in silence as well. There was over 400 men standing in one passageway. You know, I think that was, it must have been about that many. And all of a sudden, somebody started laughing. And then somebody else started laughing and people were looking around going, what, what's happening? And it was one of the leading stewards was a cartoonist and he'd been sitting there sketching this cartoon and he just stuck it up on the bulkhead and then left it there and people would look at it and they, I went up and looked at it and I saw this thing and I just burst out laughing. Uh, and it was a cartoon of a Matlow sitting on the toilet. And you know how you portray movement in a cartoon, like his hat's coming off like this and he's got a cigarette in his, in his mouth. And in the trap next door to him are four fins sticking out of the, the bog. <laughs> And in the tannoy, he'd drawn on it. Do you hear there, Captain speaking? I've just completed rounds of the of the afterheads, and quite frankly, it looks like a fucking bomb's hit it. <laughs> and it, it was it was brilliant because fear paralyzes you. This broke the spell, and it was like this enormous sense of relief of just people laughing. And I thought to myself. Do you know what? I think sitting next to the sea slug magazine, if that goes off, we're all dead anyway. You're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna survive on half a ship, <laughs> you know. So I went into the gate, and there was a load of bread rolls, and I just started cutting them open. You know that horrible primula cheese spread? I just, I was just getting <laughs> made up trays and trays of these things, and I walked out the galley in across a cross passage. And up the uh, Giant's Causeway, that was the name of the, 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 the corridor on the, the, uh, on the antrum. And um, everybody started grabbing these rolls off me as I'm walking up there. And I, I remember hearing this voice behind me and it said, Oi, where's the effing pickle? Because <laughs> I hadn't put any pickle in it. <laughs> and I turned around and I went, the effing pickle? in the effing galley, just opposite the effing thousand pound unexploded bomb. <laughs> just carried on. You know, like people were just snatching these things and that. Mm. But it was, it, it, like I say, it, it was the humour. It, it snapped you back into reality. Um, but as, the, as time wore on, I saw everybody was standing on the port side of the passageway and we were getting this running commentary and they said, uh, right, we're now going to start uh, lifting the bomb out. And, you know, you're holding your breath. And they've got this mock A-frame thing that they've put up and a little chain and hoist and stuff like that. And we were getting this thing out and they said, right, the bomb's now on the flight deck and we're now going to lower it over the port side. And without saying a word, Every single man in that passageway walked over to the starboard side. <laughs> Make any difference anyway. But nobody said anything. It was just, we're now going to be lowering it over the port side. And you could hear this. Oh, uh. <laughs> but uh, we, got, we got rid of it. Uh, apparently, we got a signal uh, immediately after saying, 
under no circumstances to, to remove it, but it was too late by then. Uh, and it was lowered over the side and we went on our way and we met up with the Stenner Sea Spread, which was a fleet maintenance group uh, ship. And we were with them for uh, some time out at sea. We we're all welders and uh, they, they were coming, patching the ship up and they couldn't do anything for the, the sea slug system. Uh, the wiring, as I recall, uh, was too badly damaged, they said. So that reduced us. Uh, our we we were afloat, uh, but we couldn't effectively fight. So we didn't really know what other part we were going to be taking in it. And uh, we ended up going back over to South Georgia uh, for some a, a bit of shelter with a fleet maintenance group. And, uh, at some period off South Georgia, the the QE two turned up carrying a load of troops and we were uh, taking the troops off the QE2 and I think we were transferring them to HMS Fearless and I remember one of the guys um, was trying to get out of the, the whatever vessel he was in and uh, get onto the Amtrib. And as he was trying to get on, uh, he lost his footing and the boat that he was on got his foot and his knee between the Amtrib and he just went <laughs> and the guy is screaming in pain and uh, he got him on, onto the flight deck and I remember they just pumped him full of morphine, stuck a, an M on his head and he was straight back in the boat, straight back on the QE2 and on his way home. But we we received a couple of uh, Argentine POWs off the uh, fields. Uh, I think it it was one of the Wessex Fives, I think, off, off one of the vessels. Anyway, th th this thing landed on the upper deck, on the flight deck. And I'd been given uh, an SLR and told, cover them. Uh, till we get them out of the, the helicopter and that, and then they'll be taken away and, I don't know, debriefed or whatever it was they were going to do with them. And they opened the side door, and these two guys were, were looking at me. <clears throat> and I remember they had, uh, they each had a towel in the hand. And I'm pointing, <laughs> I'm pointing this rifle at them, and I'm gesturing like this, you know, get out. So what did they do? They went like that. This helo is still turning and burning. You know, the rotor head's going, and there they are, holding their hands up with towels in their hand. And I'm going, no, get down like this. Anyway, we got them out. There wasn't a, there was no incident came as, uh, from that. But uh, I do recall that somebody was saying that they had been in uh, a trench for 48 hours or something like that. And all they had was a tub of margarine to eat. Um, you know, I since found out through uh, visits down there that uh, they weren't actually very well treated by their, uh, their own uh, senior officers. Not that it made me feel sorry for them, right? Because uh, you know, there's plenty of stories in that about um, about how they didn't treat the island as well. They they they, they got up to some uh, nasty tricks. They did. Uh, and we then ended up basically becoming South Georgia guard ship because that's kind of all we were fit for. Um, we kept hearing reports about um, the advances of the ground troops. I do recall uh, when we were a bit further away from uh, uh, South Georgia, a bit nearer to the um, to the main task force, that 
there was an air raid worn in red and um, three Super 8 on Dars had been launched, uh, the Argentine jets. They're the ones, they are the Argentine Navy and they're the ones that carried the Exocets. And we were all lying in the passageway and out, outside this uh, radio room and the, the guy had put it on speed we could hear it. We could hear the conversations between the, the fighter control and the, um, the Harrier pilots. I never saw a Harrier in the Falklands, by the way. Never saw one, but heard them. And you could hear them, and it seemed to take forever. And you could just hear the static, and then you go, splash one, meaning they shot one of them down. And then you hear it, splash two. And we're waiting for splash three. And I, I remember I could see in front of my face a river of urine just running down the deck where it was, it was that, uh, it was that tense. People were that scared because by then, you know, we all knew the capabilities of the Exocet. Uh, we all knew the, the consequences of, of taking one of them things on board. But Splash 3 came and um, and we were okay. We we were fortunate. We were, you know, we had our problems. We were running out of food, bad weather. We, we, we took a fair share of hits and that, but, but we lived. Mm-hmm. You know, and as the, we were getting these uh, regular updates, uh, which eventually, uh, eventually, we were told that uh, the Argentines had surrendered, and that was that. But I mean, you couldn't let your guard down because you didn't know if there was any straggler submarines or, or, or what have you. And we were actually down there for quite a while uh, after the surrender. But eventually, um, we turned north and. I was designated for the first leave party. So when we got to Ascension, uh, uh, I was chopped over to um, the airfield and I flew home and arrived at uh, Bryce Norton. Uh, I remember my mum and dad were there and my wife was there with my mother-in-law and it, obviously it was uh, uh, it was emotional, but um, I was living down in in Portsmouth with my first wife, Mandy, and we went, uh, sorry, Gosport. Uh, we went down to Gosport, and I remember when we arrived at the house, there was all these people there, all these banners, and, you know, welcome home, Mick, and, you know, all, all, I, I, I went in the house, I went straight up to my bedroom, closed the door, and waited for them all, till they'd all gone. It, uh, I wasn't, uh, I was relieved, but I wasn't in the move, move for a party. It's different. Yeah, you, you, it's good to know that you've got the support uh, at home, but you don't just put something like that down and go to a party. Well, I didn't. Right. So about a week later, um, the Antrim came in to... Uh, harbour and that was an incredible sight to see uh, the, the thousands and thousands of people it was in the summertime it was like July I think the sun was split in the sky I remember it was very hot but the um, the support of the the folk back home was amazing but um, I say I I put it behind me uh and I got on my life two years later. I was on the uh, display team and doing the shows at Earl's Court with the field gunners. Uh, come 1988, I found myself in the Persian Gulf on HMS Scylla. Uh, and it was the middle of, uh, in, in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war, which preceded the first Gulf War. And uh, we... The, the, they used to use these Swedish uh, powerboats called boghammers 
and they would be used for smuggling all, all manner of stuff across the Gulf. And they also used them to attack civilian shipping. And they attacked, the, I can't remember the name of the vessel, on Christmas Day, 1987. We were actually on um, Noel Edmonds' show. We were uh, being interviewed out there, not, not me personally. But, and as soon as it, the show went off air, uh, it went straight to action stations and this, this uh, vessel had uh, come under attack and we were uh, pulling the folk off of that. Um, but there was, I don't know, like your training kicks in, doesn't it? That's, that's what it's there for. Hmm. Uh, Hopefully, anyway. I, don't, I think it probably doesn't always. <laughs> um, you know, war's war, and some people were they not built for it. Um, was there anybody sent home from the Falklands? Because you know, uh, what, what war? It's just it's not for some people, and that's you know that's fine. But obviously, if you're I in a war. Know. Sorry, go on. I do recall there was a, a chief petty officer uh, whose job was on our Exocet system. Uh, from my recollection, I think he decided to become a pacifist on the way down, and I think he had to be restrained. Um, I, I don't know what happened to him. Mm. And the part between when I left Ascension and arrived at Bryce Norton that when the Antrim was on passage from Ascension to Portsmouth, I do believe that uh, uh, one of the chefs just cracked and uh, he was stretched off in the back of the helo. I don't know where they're talking. But, um, yeah, there, were, there, there, there was a couple of tense parts, but, you know, I think, again, we had a damn good crew who... Uh, who did the job? Um, yes, I understand that there there are people who are not cut out for it, but on the whole, out of four hundred plus men on our ship, um, we had a lot of good guys. Uh, you know, you would you would find yourself in in all manner of things that you, if you'd read the small print, you probably would have expected it. You know, they say uh, education's when you read the small print experiences when you don't. You know, I remember seeing what, what, uh, one of the lads, he was supposed to be on the first day party, run up to the uh, the signal deck because uh, the guy man manning one of the Orlikan guns, I think that was on the port side, uh, he'd been hit. Uh, and when we got up there, he, he, you strap yourself into an Orlikan, big 20 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft. There's a big leather strap goes over your back. And um, I won't mention his name, but <laughs> he was supposed to be on the first aid party. We got this this lad unstrapped from the gun and and, uh, and he took his first aid jacket off and strapped himself into the organ and started firing back. Uh, he's a chef. I don't suppose he ever expected to find himself doing anything like that, but... Um, Mick, you mentioned earlier something interesting. You're talking about this this Reddit culture. Can you can you tell us a bit more? Yeah, about it? I suppose that the the reason that I'm talking to you today is because I, I, I look at some of the uh, some of the other YouTube channels that cover cover conflicts and uh, Mark Felton's one is a particularly good one and he does a lot of stuff on the Falcons he covers a range of things and I was watching the stuff about the Falcons and then you get into the comments section and you see all these guys who clearly are keyboard warriors and they they it's almost like they they think they can do something about it. but it's, So I invented this uh, pseudonym and um, went on there and basically start, started trying to calm them down a little bit. And, and 
Funnily enough, the people who were speaking the same language as me were Argentine vets who were interjecting as well. Uh, and then you'd have Vietnam vets, uh, Iraq, and um, I just I wanted to try and uh, steady the ship a little bit, you know, if you like. And it, we can see the consequences of that now, where you're seeing in a certain country that starts with a U over in Europe, people going over there, uh, the, the Reddit battalion, isn't it? You know, they, they, they all talk themselves into thinking, hey, we can do something about this. Well, <laughs> that's the dangers of social media. If you're up against a, uh, a state uh, military, that's, that's a whole different ballgame. You know, getting chased around the deck by a fighter jet is, is, is no laughing matter. Uh, and when you've got some sort of fire and forget cruise missile thing being fired from a long distance away, it, it's going to ruin your day. And these lads have found that out um, to, their, to their cost. They're dead because they egged each other on social media. Uh, uh, war's not like that. You don't you don't press replay. It's for keeps. But I um, I mentioned about the Vulcan uh, earlier on, and I was at Scottish Air Show I think in two thousand fifteen, and the Vulcan was on its last run, and Martin Withers who uh, was one of the Vulcan pilots. Uh, he was the first uh, Vulcan pilot to strike Fort Stanley. <clears throat> he was standing there and folk were coming up to him, all these little kids with the uh, Scottish Air Show uh, programmes in the hand and getting them to, um, to sign them. And I couldn't resist it. So I stood in the queue with all these kids and eventually... I got to the front of the queue and I didn't have a programme. And he, he kind of went like this with his pen. I said, I'm not here for your, your autograph. I said, I want an explanation. He said, what do you mean? I said, you flew over my head uh, when I was on the Antrim. I remember seeing it. And he said, so what? And I said, well, I waved at you and you never waved back. <laughs> and he just looked and he went, I was busy. <laughs> And when you read the accounts of the Black Book missions, I mean, that's another level in itself. Yeah, we should give a shout out here um, to the Vulcan missions. And, and it would be great to get one of the crew members on the podcast. Yeah. Um, I've watched all the documentaries and I've got the book here on my shelf. It was uh, an incredible feat. Uh, just the refueling plan alone is is amazing. Yeah, and they did it several times. I thought it was a one-off, yeah. but well, I, I I worked out where we were um, at that time, uh, and I'm ninety nine percent sure that that was the first one. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, I. I I went back down in 2019 and I'm really glad that I did um, because I wanted to speak to Islanders. I want to speak to other veterans. As I said to you before, like the difference between the experience and the, the lads on the Intrepid himself only sitting a, a short distance apart. Um, I also got to speak to the Islanders. Uh, the, the stories that they told were amazing. When they, when they take you around, there's a, a Falkland Islander called Tony, and he's an absolute mine of information. Uh, he would really be worth interviewing. But I, I, I was uh, invited to dinner, and the, the woman there was telling me the stories um, of where she was locked up in the uh, at Goose Green uh, in the 
cattle shed, I think it was. They were in there about 30 days. And they told us that every couple of days uh, they would take the men. I'm only telling you what they told me. They, they would take the men out and they would line them outside and basically form a firing squad in front of them. And then they would go, you know, ready, aim, and then stop and then put them all back in a psychological torture. Uh, you know, the, the soldiering and this being a subhuman, you know, you don't have to go around torturing folk like that. But the reason that I mentioned going back is because it replaces, it changes your perspective. You, you get to see the islands at peace. Uh, and they're actually quite stunning. The, the wildlife down there is just incredible. Some of the beaches that are down there are, are, are amazing. But it's kind of, it, it brings closure, even though I didn't bring uh, an awful lot of uh, baggage back with me. I only ever had one bad reaction. That wasn't not, not long after we came back, but... Uh, uh, I would recommend to any of uh, the vets out there that that haven't gone back. If you've got any, if you've got any trauma still existing, do you know one of the best things you can do is go back um, because you you've got family down there. You you'd be treated like a king or queen. They they're more British than we are. They should you know, um, P and O or bloody one of these shipping companies should lay on a bloody cruise, shouldn't they? And then all the all the mat all the matlows um, and the pilots could they could get to you know to revisit from the from the what am I saying the maritime perspective rather than the the the, the land side? It would be I think that would be a special thing. It would. It would. Um, I mean, I, um, I, I, I expedition to Antarctica on, a, on a, uh, the, the expedition ship Plantius, and it, I didn't know it at the time, but it was one of the best experiences of my life. It was just the, the yeah. whole thing, rocking up in Ushuaia down there in Tierra, Tierra del Fuego and mm -hmm. spending time on the southern tip of the world. Then you, then you board your expedition ship, and it's just, it's just. I mean, I mean they do. I mean, in, in in fairness, they do expeditions to the Falklands and to South Georgia, but I mean, an actual veterans expedition could be that would be quite some special thing. I think probably be better than the last time I went down there sailing. So. I would fair. say it'd be better food, but I'm going to be honest. Big shout out to the Royal Navy and Royal Marine chefs. I was on Invincible for a year and the food was just incredible. Um, you'd have to be a bit of a dick to criticise it, put it that way. Those omelette, omelette Sundays, I think we used to have. Oh, my God. How much cheese, chef? <laughs> <laughs> that much. Yeah. Dunk. <laughs> Um, I was on the illustrious, so uh, uh, they're damned hard work, those ships. Damned hard work. They've got all these uh, conveniences to help you store ship and guarantee they break down every time. When you've got to move 1,400 bags of potatoes down about, about six decks by hand, that ain't funny. <laughs> but, yeah, funny enough, I've done that as well. What, what, after I left the mob... Um, one job I had was loading stores onto um, submarines and ships in the in the dockyard, military submarines and ships, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to form part of a chain gang, and <laughs> we yeah. would do we literally would do that, just throwing such slugs deck. to each other, and it was it was fascinating because I got to go on a submarine, which I never. I don't think I'd ever done before. 
And um, couldn't believe how tiny these things are. I think on the, when you watch these war films, these, you know, dive, dive, dive or whatever it is, so you, you get this impression that these things are huge and you can yeah, play no. fo- football inside them. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's couldn't be further from the truth. They're just tiny, absolutely tiny. Um, you reminded me actually that where you bring up uh, submarine. Um, I was taking statements in, from a guy in South Wales to do with some job that we were doing, and uh, he he said he'd been in South Georgia, and I said to him, "What were you doing there?" And he said, "Oh, I was involved with this uh, uh, towing this old submarine out to sea and uh, sinking it. This Argentinian submarine." I says, "All oh, right." I said, well, we played a part in <laughs> beating it up in the first place. And he said to me, oh, I've got something that you might be interested in. And he goes away to the garage and he comes in, and you know, like the, the big name plate that you get on the side. He comes in with this big board and on the side, ARA, Santa Fe. I said, you couldn't make that up. Um, I did say to him, like, the uh, submarine museum at Gosport would be glad to have that. Uh, I've never verified that it's gone there, but somebody did say to me that it was there along with an Argentine flag. But uh, what's the chances of that? (laughs) Yes. Listen, Mick, this has been an absolutely fascinating chat. Thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's um, it's very good of you. Uh, I, I appreciate what you're doing, collating these stories. Well... We're doing our best here, mate. You know, it it, mm-hmm. it all feels a bit surreal, if I was honest. Um, the whole thing, I mean, it was so long ago, but it affected all of us, you know. Yeah. In fact, it affected us as a nation, those old enough to remember. And then, of course, to go through the Marines where, where the Falklands was, a, it was, it was the, um, you know, it was the proving ground for the Royal Marines in recent years. It was yeah. the kind of ideal theatre of war, war, war for their for, for their skills, and to come through that as well, and then to actually be talking to people that were were down there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it all feels a bit a bit surreal, but I think we should get these stories recorded. Um. And yeah, and that's <laughs> that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. So, anything in the uh, on the future for you, Mick? Anything you want to me- to to mention? Are you going to just go on and live your life? Um, we're just getting through the last couple of years. <laughs> Um, we, my wife started up her own coaching business, um, and the idea is that we sell up and move to the Algarve, but, uh, as I'm sure you're keenly aware, uh, the world's in a, a state of, it's in a strange place at the moment. And, um, We need to continue to fight against that verbally um, uh, and sort of kind of wake people up as to what's happening around them. You know, 40 years ago, we went and removed a tyrannical dictatorship. And, uh, well, I might be wrong, but I see one forming up around here as well. Yeah, you're not wrong, mate. You're not wrong. Um, it's only, it's a funny thing, isn't it? You either see it or you don't. Sometimes yeah, when every everyone... Single, every single institution, every single piece of legislation, every procedure, uh, policy, just the, the establishment circled the wagons. Yes, yes. Uh, I found out that all. I just found out that uh, all these uh, systems are bullshit. They are bullshit. 
Well, they all maintain a status quo that's just not not good for any of us, don't they? No. You know, the people that do profit from it, they only profit in terms of financial gain, which translates to power. Yeah. But, but power and financial gain is, is you're never going to, you know, what's it saying in the scriptures? It's easier for a, camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for for a rich man to enter heaven. Um, And this is it. You know, everything in our society is based around these, I call them psychopaths, probably sociopaths, psychopaths. Um, All they do, their whole day, their whole life, their whole brainwashing, their whole schema is all about power. It's Mm -hmm. all about power and screwing other people over. That's their only thing. Nothing to do with in life, nothing to do with kindness, peace, love, empathy, trying to create a better planet for us all, trying to stop destroying, you know, the environment, preventing war, because it's, you know, there's many, many, many other options of no, none of that. And what you've experienced is that when you, when you try and swim against that, it becomes really painful. Oh, I you know, becomes really painful. And I went through it with, with my um, drug addiction, realizing that, hang on, this is this status quo. It's fucking bullshit. It's all bullshit. You know, where's all these wonderful, kind people that are here to support me? They've all just fucked off because it, it is an inconvenience to them, you know? It's an inconvenience <laughs> them to pick up the phone to me once a week or to s- stop off and go, you all right, Craig? You know, it's just... Uh, and... And I think that that brings on, mate, doesn't it? And in, that brings on a, an epiphany, an awakening. Yeah. Um, it does. It, it pulls the scales back from your eyes big time. Yeah. It's hard to take at first It's because it's unbelievable at first, but it happens to be true. Yeah, anyway. exactly. Exactly. It is. It's, it's insane. And it, 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 it goes really, really deep. I'm glad we've touched on it, Mick, because um, you know we give faith to all those people out there that 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 that, that understand it. Um, and I think it's getting more and more now harder to defend for people because so yeah. many pe- so many people see it now. So many people see it, or they certainly see enough of the picture to realise we've we've all been lied to massively. Um, oh, I. but uh, yes, you know yeah. what? we'll get through it. Say again, mate. We'll get through it. Yeah, we will. We'll win because we'll we win do. our spiritual battle. That's yeah. it. We'll win our spiritual battle, and uh, and uh, that that's that's all we can do, and it's all we need to do. Yes. <laughs> that and turn off the mainstream media. <laughs> Mick, listen, this has been a fascinating chat, mate. Thank you so much for sharing your, your, your Falklands experience. Um, uh, l- like you said, you know, I think it's good. We get these stories chronicled um, and not, not just by the uh, BBC format, but these informal chats where, where I think the whole story comes out. Um, so well, I would speak to my. Oh, we got a pause. I just said there that I, I, I'm lucky with my wife's uncle. Uh, he's 97 years old and he's as sharp as a tack. And he tells me uh, uh, stories about witnessing the. Uh, bomb in Hiroshima and the Arctic convoys and oh, it made your hair curl. Yes. I went to Hiroshima once and I stood on the the bridge in the middle of the city and I I looked at the only remaining building from, from that and um, I had the most bizarre feeling come over me, like something I've never, ever felt before and never felt since just to think that their people were it was about eight o'clock in the morning they was probably having their breakfast 
and <sighs> suddenly the biggest atrocity ever committed on man went off mm. and no one would have known what what the hell it was or what was happening it was yes insane insane Mick let's let's chat again at any other time you fancy coming back on the podcast um, you're more than welcome uh, thank and, you very much Chris yeah and uh, to everybody at home massive thank you for joining us if you could please like and subscribe that will really help us to keep getting these stories out there and we'll see you next time. Thank you.